Thank you very much. Um, it's great to great to be here in front of uh, undergraduates. It's uh, where I where I'm at is a research institution, and so we only have uh, graduate students, and so I uh, I miss uh, the energy and uh, enthusiasm that you guys have. Not to say that the graduate students aren't enthusiastic too, but uh, anyway, it's just a rare treat for me to give a bona fide lecture like this, and so I'm looking forward to it. So um, my research um, lies at the intersection of uh, marine microbiology and um, basically analytical chemistry. And so what I'm going to uh, talk to you today about is how uh, I look at the intersection of those fields with the, the biological carbon pump, which is something that you guys uh, have, have already been uh, introduced to uh, during the course of this, uh, of, of this term. Um, and so I'll kind of build from what you are probably familiar with and then into areas that you're probably not familiar with and hopefully I'll be able to bring you along the way. Um, but if you get lost, um, you could please stop me and ask a question. Uh, or if you get lost, that's kind of uh, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm doing this on purpose, but that's kind of part of the scientific process because when you go to research lectures like I do, um, you're looking at cutting edge research, even though I've been in the field for uh, 15 years, I still don't know what people are talking about when they get to the end of their talks, okay? So it's kind of a, a natural progression and I think as you think about uh, moving forward as a scientist uh, or someone who wants to go into the sciences, it's kind of uh, one of the most critical lessons is to be able to recognize and become at peace with the fact that you don't know things. Okay, so I'm going to, because it's amazing. It's like the more you know, the, the, the less you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm not going to purposely try and lose you, but I'm just going to try and um, introduce you to that, uh, that idea. So... This is, uh, this is my view of the biological uh, carbon pump. It has uh, plankton in the surface ocean who make uh, sinking particles. Uh, these, there's obviously the scales here are all weird uh, because you have zooplankton and phytoplankton and you have little bacteria and uh, they make sinking particles that sink down uh, into the uh, deep ocean. And so uh, this is a really important process because the biological par uh, carbon pump um, is one of the things that controls the carbon dioxide uh, levels in the atmosphere. And so just to kind of remind you of how this goes, there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and there's carbon dioxide that dissolves in surface water. And so when surface water is in contact with the atmosphere, there's an exchange, and it comes to a rough equilibrium. Not exactly a complete equilibrium because there are other processes at play. And that is the conversion between uh, carbon dioxide and biomass by phytoplankton. And here I've kind of kept it in the broadest possible terms, calling it particulate organic carbon. But if you run the reaction this way, that's photosynthesis. Uh, and if you run it that way, it's respiration. And so the carbon pump is defined by this fine balance between those two pathways. And there's a small leak that comes out of that pathway, and that leads to the flux of particular organic carbon to the deep sea. Um, and that small leak is important because ultimately a lot of this stuff n never makes it to the bottom and instead it is respired back to CO2. So you can see you've taken carbon from the atmosphere, run it through the biological pump, and now you've put it into the deep sea. And so that's, uh, that's really important uh, because it's the... the um, this part of the ocean, the, uh, the mesopelagic or the, the, the layer of the ocean that's just below the sunlit layer, that's really the only place that, that um, is a viable place for to, the ocean to sequester carbon, at least on the time scales that we're in, um, interested in when we're talking about human change and the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so you've probably heard about this, but just a gee whiz fact about where all the carbon dioxide that has gone from uh, from fossil fuel burning, just the back of the envelope, and maybe you've given them different back of the envelope figures, is a third of it is in the atmosphere, a third of it has uh, been soaked up by the uh, terrestrial biosphere, and about a third of it is in the ocean. Okay, So you just think about that, this massive experiment we're doing with the carbon dioxide re levels rising in the atmosphere, thank goodness that the ocean here has taken up a lot of that carbon, and so has uh, the terrestrial biosphere. So as I go through this talk, I want to uh, kind of... 
highlight some of the challenges to studying microbes and their, their impact on the, on the biological pump. And so there are these D words. So one is uh, the ocean is incred incredibly diverse. So there's millions of species of microorganisms that are involved in the biological pump from the phytoplankton that take up the carbon dioxide and then turn it into their biomass to the bacteria that run the reaction uh, through respiration uh, in, in the opposite direction. So, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was some kind of a timing thing. I hope, uh, well, we'll see, I might have to keep, keep clicking back and forth here, sorry. Uh, also, it's uh, uh, highly dynamic. So, um, all of the particular organic carbon uh, in the surface ocean uh, on a global basis uh, turns over about uh, every week. Okay, so that's that's really amazing for me to think about as all these billions and billions, countless uh, microorganisms, phytoplankton, bacteria, by, by this time next week, half of them, probably more than half of them will be gone. Okay, so it's a rough life being a microbe when you only have a few days to live. Okay, but think about that in terms of the time scales of, of, of what we're talking about today. Okay, so this whole ocean is constantly overturning its, uh, the organisms in it. Also, uh, it's incredibly d dilute. So the microbial uh, particulate organic carbon, so the biomass of microbes, is only, uh, you know, a billionth of the amount of, of, of seawater. So the microbes themselves are very, very scarce. And then finally, the last one is that working at sea can be difficult at times, and I just want to show this funny. Have you seen videos of people doing oceanography before? Don't go out when it's like this, okay? I just encourage you to that. But uh, anyway, uh, the ocean is one of the last wildernesses. Um, if you think about it, we can go out and be at sea for many weeks and never see another ship. Uh, and so you can't run down to your, to your neighborhood hardware store uh, when something has gone wrong. It requires uh, a, a lot of skills that go beyond what, you're, what you learn in class. So there are these four Ds, and you can kind of think about those as we go through the lecture today. Okay, so back to the biological pump. So the first step is... is uh, um, is I'm having problems with my PowerPoint here. Let's just do that again. Whoop, back. Sorry. Maybe this has something to do with. Okay. Well, anyway, there's the there are the phytoplankton, and they are in the surface ocean. And phytoplankton, we're talking about cyanobacteria, which are tiny bacteria, and also uh, eukaryotic phytoplankton. Some of them, some diatoms, you can actually see with the naked eye. They're so big. For the for the most part, we're talking about microbes, and um, and again, they're the primary agents of carbon dioxide fixation uh, in the surface ocean, and so uh, they they soak up carbon dioxide. Now. Being phytoplankton is tough because you're, you're constantly under threat of being grazed. And so zooplankton eat the carbon dioxide, or sorry, eat the phytoplankton. You've taken up the carbon dioxide. They respire. Uh, bacteria do basically a similar thing. Um, but what happens is that when they, they graze, they lead to the formation of, these, uh, of, of these, these particles. And I'll try and play that again here. Okay, so they graze, and um, when they graze, they create fecal material, and this fecal material is one of the major sinks of, carb of the biological pump, and then you also have dead phytoplankton, that both of these things kind of come, come into play. So you're, you wind up with these sinking particles, and these sinking particles, again, the scales are all wrong. But they're small. You know, they're, look at uh, most of them, if you look at a, uh, a comma in your textbook or something like that, that's, that's the size of particles a lot of them are. You know, some of them uh, may be a little bigger than that. You know, some of them may be as, you know, as big as a word in your textbook. But for the most part, we're talking about small particles. And so if you think about it, this is a really interesting uh, transformation from a gas now into something that's particulate that can sink uh, in the ocean under the influence of gravity. Okay, so, so what about this? So this here is, this is a plot, this is a very famous plot in oceanography called the Martin Curve. And what it describes is the magnitude of the flux, which is on this axis here, uh, with depth as you go down. And so that flux of raining biological material gets, is, gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you get deeper and deeper and deeper. 
And so this is due primarily to the activity of the microbes uh, that, and other organisms that interact with those particles on their trek from the surface ocean to the deep sea. Now, I just want to contrast that um, with this plot here. And this is a plot of the C14 age of, of ocean water. So have you guys seen plots like this or talked about using carbon-14 dating in the ocean? Yeah, I see heads nodding. Okay, so you've seen something like this before. So this is good. Still review. But in, the, for example, in the North Pacific, the deep water. So this, this is a plot here with depth. This is the southern. Uh, this is Antarctica down here, the Arctic up here. And this scale bar here is, is, is uh, um, indicating the, the C14 age of the water. And so the water in the North Pacific or any, plate, any of these basins is older the deeper they go. So that tells you it's been longer uh, since it was last in contact with the ocean. And so this is the reservoir uh, of carbon that the biological pump feeds. And it's important to recognize that this is old water because to a first approximation, the deeper you go, the more the long term the sequestration will be because the water is less likely to be re in contact with the atmosphere. Okay, so deeper to a first approximation equals longer uh, sequestration. So that's very important, and in biological models, this equation is present in, in a lot of them. Um, it used to be all the models, but they're starting to get updated. And so there's a lot of um, re research, including the research that I did my master's degree on, to figure out this coefficient here, it's called the attenuation coefficient, or B. So the idea was is if you could figure out what B is, and you knew the flux up top, or you knew something about primary productivity, you could use this to project what the flux would be uh, in the deep ocean, because that parameterizes this, this, this line that's drawn through the data. Um, but it turns out that um, there is no one B. And that's, that's the problem with that, that approach. Um, so these are, flux, these are actual data, and this is just from one study. So the same, same x-axis and same y-axis. You can see this, in this case, only goes down to 500 meters. And you probably can't see it from the back of the room here, but the variation in the B values is uh, almost two orders of magnitude. Okay? So there's a lot, a lot of variability here in B. And so people have tried to figure out where, what causes this variability, and that's kind of where my research comes in. One of the places that hasn't been looked at that much is the sinking particles themselves in terms of the activity of the microbes that interact with them. So a lot of people measure that, that POC, and they look for, for example, like mineral material or something like that that might make the particle heavy and make it sink faster. Um, uh, they might look at the uh, surface community and think about the phytoplankton that are there and how that food web is structured and relate that to the types of the particles that are coming down. Um, and you'll see, though, that my view of the particle of the biological pump, even though it's massive and it's happening all over the ocean, my view is that sinking particle, that, that's that little particle that's, that's about the size of a, of a period or a comma in your textbook. That's kind of my frame of reference. So when a bacterium, or a, sorry, when a sinking particle begins to sink, there's all kinds of tidbits in here that uh, attract uh, heterotrophic bacteria. Some of them are actually incorporated uh, when they're egested from zooplankton. But there's a lot of, of uh, the first step after this happens is uh, colonization. So microbes are coming to these particles, and they are beginning the process of, of de degrading these particles. So these, for, for, the, for the purposes of, these, of this lecture, these bacteria here, think of them as all heterotrophic bacteria. They're all respiring or turning biomass back into carbon dioxide. Um, now, a couple of gee whiz facts here that you guys have probably heard of. There are almost as many bacteria in a gallon of seawater as there are people uh, on Earth. So that's a back of the envelope thing. So just imagine that. Um, also, I got one for you. So if you took all the DNA from all the microbes in the ocean and you made it into a single strand, how long do you guys think it would be? Anybody willing to hazard a guess? Just for the sake, just to keep the conversation going. <laughs> Anybody? To the moon. You do well to the moon. Great. 
I almost always get that response. Thank you very much. Because it's a great frame of reference because it's actually uh, 15 billion light years. That's how long the strand would be. Okay? So I'm glad you brought up the moon example because it's, you can only think about that information in cosmological terms, basically. So imagine that a string of information, one, one molecule at a time going from here all the way to the Big Bang. That's how much information is in the ocean, okay? So there's a lot to this here. And so I, I bring up that point as just a little bit of a caveat because I basically said for the, I just said think about all these microbes as being organisms that just respire. Well, that's a huge, huge, huge oversimplification, but it's, what we, it's where we're at still, despite us knowing about all the information that's in the ocean. And this is what a real sinking particle looks like. Um, what we can do is take these particles and add a stain that binds to DNA and uh, look at it under a, a fluorescence microscope. And so all these dots here, these are actually the DNA in bacteria. Okay? And bacteria don't have a nucleus, so it's basically the whole cell. Um, so you can see all these different microbes here. And then you have bits and pieces. I don't know if you can see this kind of honeycomb piece here. That's a hunk of a diatom. So they make their shells out of, out of, out of glass. And they make really intricate patterns here. And then you have some things that are probably fecal pellets other stuff that we don't know what it is. Um, but this is a real, if you look at this under a microscope, it's also not still. There's microbes and other organisms moving through it. So it's, it's, a, it's a living community. Each particle is a unique ecosystem. At least that's the way I think about it. And um, it's important to recognize that the bacteria that are attracted to these particles are totally different than the bacteria in the water. So, it's, so a sinking particle, when it sinks, it's not just like flypaper, okay? They're not just smooshing on all the bugs that it runs into on the way down. They're actually recruiting, and I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing here, okay, terribly. <laughs> but what's happening is when those particles sink, there are uh, organic molecules that are coming off of them, and they act as an, as a, as an attractant to the microbes. So the microbes are drawn to them. And when they get drawn to them, they grow. And so you wind up, these are from, these are, this is not, a, not a, a particle from the deep ocean. This is just an aggregate of phytoplankton. Um, but the point here is that the bacteria that are free living in the ocean are completely different than the bacteria that are on, uh, on these sinking particles. So it's not just flypaper, it's a specialized community. And so when you start to think about this, um, that, that image that I showed you with all the, the activity and things like that, um, and, and, and the fact that it's an ecosystem, one of the characteristics of an ecosystem that we can all relate to uh, is uh, communication. And as marine microbiologists, we're just now starting to recognize the importance of communication uh, between microbes in the ocean. And um, one of the languages uh, that, that we found are spoken by, um, by microbes in the ocean involve these molecules uh, here called acylated homocerine lactones. So I'll, talk, I'll, I'll introduce this. I'll keep coming back to them. They're called acylated homocerine lactones, or AHLs uh, for short. So this is where the analytical chemistry comes in because we started looking in these sinking particles for these communication molecules. Because to us, that's, that, that's a harbinger of an ecosystem uh, that there's communication be and potentially coordination between the organisms uh, that are on these particles. Um, so before we started, there was a little bit of information here. And then I had a graduate student who uh, went out and actually measured uh, these things. And so, but before we can talk about these um, acylated homocerine lactones, I want to talk to you about quorum sensing. So has anybody ever heard of my bacterial quorum sensing? Anybody had a, a microbiology class or anything like that? Okay. Here's what quorum sensing is. Quorum sensing is when microbes communicate with each other and then they decide to do things as a group. Okay, and I'm going to give you an example now that's not a marine example, but you'll probably never forget it. Okay? And this is the eating uh, undercooked shellfish example. Okay? So 
A lot of these microbes that we're going to be talking about are Vibrio, and, they, and one of the things they do is they can cause human disease, including food, sick, uh, food poisoning. And so you can imagine if you've, hopefully this has never happened to you, it's happened to me, it'll probably happen to you sometime during your life, is you'll eat something, and you'll, have a, you know, you'll go out and uh, have a nice meal, and then you'll have dessert, and you'll have a couple drinks afterwards, and everything will be going dandy. And then you get home, and all of a sudden, just like that, you feel like you're going to die. Okay? <laughs> and that's quorum sensing. Basically what's happening is uh, you ingest some bad bacteria. And then these bacteria here in this blue, they begin to grow in your digestive tract. But what's, neat, what's, what they, what's really clever that these bacteria have done is they don't express the virulence behavior. They don't, they, don't, they, they don't make you sick one at a time. And one of the reasons for that is because they don't want you to, to, to mount a response to, the, to this. It's effectively an infection, right? So what they do is they grow and they grow and they grow and they don't express their virulence genes, the genes that cause the disease. So they're there until they reach a critical threshold. And then they reach that critical threshold, and we'll call this activity rate here. This is the making you have terrible stomach, you know what I'm talking about, okay? That virulence here. They reach this threshold, and they boom, they all turn on at once. And that's why you feel great, and then you feel terrible. And it only happens in about a half hour. And that's because that's exactly what's happening. They're not going to express their virulence genes until they feel like they've got a chance to take you. Okay, that's what they're doing, and it's a terrible thing when it happens. So, so this is what they do: they switch on their virulent genes, and you're not feeling very well. But you can think about this as any activity, and the activity I want to talk about is the activity of microbes on those sinking particles that are degrading those particles. So as they go deeper and deeper in the ocean, think about this time. So a particle starts its trek in the surface ocean is sinking down into the deep sea. And the microbes that are in that sinking particle are growing and growing and growing. And then I'm going I'm to show you evidence that invokes this quorum sensing behavior. So um, how do they know how many other bacteria are there? You know, bacteria they can't see, they can't hear, they talk to each other with chemical communications. And one of the molecules that, again, that we're going to talk about are these acylated homocerine lactones here. And basically, these molecules build up in lockstep with cell density. And then at some point, they realize or the, uh, the, the molecules accumulate to, to, to such a level that the bacteria realize that they have a quorum. Okay, so I'm going to go over this one more time. And I'm going to use this, the, the, the example here uh, in this room where you can think about it as some parliament or something like that, or uh, a meeting where, 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 where uh, group decisions are made. So at the very beginning you have a bacterium here, and there's the signaling molecule. And it's just one on a lonely particle. And so what it does is it sends out these AHLs asking, the purpose of these molecules is to see if anybody else is out there. And if there aren't any other, uh, other similar organisms out there, then these AHLs, they just go out into the environment. Um, and so the organism knows, okay, I'm on my own, so I'm gonna engage in behavior now, that's what I do when I'm on my own. Um, but if there are other organisms there, they start to grow, they're all sending out their signals too. And these signals start to accumulate uh, in the environment. And so all the, all the organisms are sending out these signals, but they're also sensing them at the same time. And then they reach a, a critical level here. And what happens at this critical level is that acylated homocerine lactone sits down on what's called a transcriptional activator. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a protein that um, sits down on the DNA and begins to, to transcribe the genes that are whatever is under quorum sensing control. And so they build up, it binds to that protein, the protein then de- transcribes all the, the uh, different genes which are represented here in this pie chart. So that's how quorum sensing works. 
Uh, but I imagine you'll forget this slide before you forget the food poisoning example. All right, so oceanographers, in a sense, we can lay claim to the discovery of this system because one of the first systems that it was ever characterized in uh, was in the Hawaiian bobtail squid. So Hawaiian bobtail squid are night feeders. And um, and an amazing symbiosis between uh, squid and bacteria, they take up, they essentially cultivate a group of microbes from the Vibrio genus in these organs on their belly. Okay? And the, uh, the behavior that is uh, regulated by quorum sensing in these systems is luminescence. So the bacteria actually grow. That's their quorum sensing behavior, behaviors. They glow. I said grow. They glow. And so what the squid does is it harvests and it be able, it has, be able to make light on its belly. And so the reason for that is, like I said, they're night predators. And one of their, what they, it's actually camouflage against the light of the moon and the stars and things like that. Because from below, they're a shadow. But if they illuminate their undersides, then they can actually blend in um, with, uh, with the, 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 the moonshine that's coming down from, from, the, uh, from, from above. So this is a really interesting uh, uh, adaptation. And what's neat is every morning, these uh, squid kick out all, their, all the vibrio in these light organs. And then they go into the beach and they take a nap during the day, and while they're there, they eat a little bit of sand. And that sand has these vibrio in it. And it's perfectly timed. Because they grow all day and don't do anything until the evening time. They've reached their quorum, and then as their, their quorum sensing related behavior is just glowing. So it happens every day, day after day. It's a perfectly orchestrated rhythm between an animal and microbes with quorum sensing being the point of the symbio symbiosis between them. So a few years ago, a paper came out. Uh, an individual, our team actually looked at satellite data. And they actually identified circumstances where even in the upper ocean, there was evidence of this bioluminescence from bacteria. That, uh, and they invoked quorum sensing with that as well. So there might be some random conditions, and they weren't sure what here. This patch here um, is, is, is large. I mean, you can see the, the Horn of Africa here and the Arabian Peninsula and the Red Sea. So this is a big, uh, big area. So it can happen all kinds of scales. Now let's go back to these molecules. So these molecules are, are the crux of it all. Um, because that's how organisms sense the quorum. They sense the, 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 the population of other organisms there. And so these, mo these molecules have all different shapes and sizes. There's a lot of chemical diversity on this end. So interestingly, one of these families of, of, of molecules has this part here, and on this part is actually the flavor of vanilla. Okay. So vanilla is a molecule. You have to recognize that the flavor of vanilla is a molecule. And I don't, I, I, for whatever reason, uh, that was one of their adaptations as they hang that off the end of that molecule. So there's all different kinds of varieties of, of these things. They're relatively short-lived. Okay? And if you think about it, that's important. And the reason that's important is um, microbes only live for a day or two. So they want to be able to change their, their behavior on timescales that are shorter than that. So they don't want to secrete a message and then have their progeny be beholden to the same message a week later. So all microbial signals are short-lived. Okay, so now getting back to the biological pump. How are we going to explore this? How are we going to look and see if there's quorum sensing? How are we going to look and see if there's the communication molecules? And how are we going to look and see if there's a coordinated effort by bacteria when they reach a quorum? And how does that relate to the biological pump? Well, the first thing we have to do is collect a lot of particles. And um, you'll see what I mean by a lot of particles here in a minute. So we put these things out. These are like giant funnels. So you can't see it, but they're open at the top. They look like a plankton net. We put them down, but they're you know this big around. And we hang them off the boat 
and we suspend them at like 150 meters, right below where the euphotic zone ends. And they just basically sit there, a big funnel, and they collect the particles as they rain down, and we wind up collecting them here in this thing. This is called the cot end. It's the very end of the trap. So this is a sediment trap collecting all kinds of stuff. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to use the, the, the particles we collect. We're going to look for AHLs in them. And we're going to conduct experiments with the particles to try and get at whether or not this quorum sensing is there and to get at its role in the biological carbon pump. So just I'm going to show some videos now of here's what these things look like. So we're getting them ready. So we're on the ship here and uh, we're getting them ready for sea. Uh, that's what my, one of the technicians in my laboratory. Okay, and then we put them off uh, the back of the boat and they sink down uh, deep into the ocean. This is it on its way down. Um, so we put them off the back of the boat and we actually suspend them from, from floats and they sit out there and we usually put them out there for about a day. So they're deep down, just a big funnel, stuff is raining down. They sit there for a day and this is the risky part. We always assume that anything you put over the side of the boat is gone. Just assume it's gone. And if you get it back, it's a good day, right? They just don't ever think it's going to come back. And we have a lot of superstitions. I'm constantly knocking on wood and things like that in hopes that we get these things back. Because sometimes, well, things happen that you would never expect. Like your trap getting attacked by a pod, pod of, of pilot whales. So you can see the trap up here in this, and this was being swarmed upon by these pilot whales. Uh, but we managed to get this, the, get them back after the pilot whale attack, and then we take everything back apart, and um, we bring the trap up, and then um, have to take all these bits and pieces apart. And it's a, uh, you know, it involves a big team of people, you know, a huge team, you know, like ten people are involved. And at the end, this is what we get. Now it's not a very clear image, okay? But even if it were right here, you would be like. Seriously, we've been at sea for three weeks so we can get this. There's almost nothing in there, okay? It's just barely anything. And the point is, is that don't get this image in your head where you're in, it's the ocean and there's stuff screaming past you like a, like a, like a blizzard. It's nothing like that. What, what makes it so important is the size of the ocean. If you look at any one area as big around as this, barely anything comes down. But there are billions upon billions of areas of this uh, in the ocean, and that's what contributes to the biological pump. So that's why we have to put out such big funnels, is so we can get almost nothing. But that, the stuff that we get is like gold, and we conduct a whole bunch of experiments with it. And so we've done work all over the world um, looking at, uh, at these particles. And... Um, one of our biggest breakthroughs, and this is what led to the, my graduate student's publication, is we were able to measure the signaling molecules in the sinking particle themselves. So I think, I'm not going to give you a lesson in analytical chemistry, but one of the ways that we do this is you can buy these molecules from a catalog, and uh, then you analyze them. With an, we use what's called a HPLC MS, or uh, it's a high performance liquid chromatography coupled to a, a, a triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. It doesn't really matter. If you look at it in a lab, it looks like a, looks like a dishwasher. Okay? It doesn't look like anything uh, uh, special. But um, what we do is we put it on the, this instrument and we wind up getting these peaks in the pure standard that are just like what we found uh, in the trap. And these peaks have to do with how the mass spectrometer sees uh, the molecules coming through. So when we published this, it was a real breakthrough because there was no doubt that we saw the molecules in the ocean in these little sinking particles. Now remember I said it was a, that there are a lot of different types of acylated homocyanin lactones? Well, we found that too. Um, <clears throat> We found about uh, eight different kinds. And we uh, isolated some microbes from the sinking particles and we could see that there's kind of two languages that are being spoken. Uh, one is these three oxo AHLs. It doesn't really matter, but see how that one has the oxygen right there and that one doesn't? Well, it turns out that whether that oxygen was there or not delineated some part of the language because only some microbes 
use the three oxo, but some of the other microbes use ones that didn't have that oxygen group on the third carbon up there. Okay, so it's not important where, where the oxygen is. What's important is to recognize that there are clearly two languages being spoken. Now, why are they talking? That's the other thing. So, if you think about corn, if you think about the food poisoning example I brought up earlier, um, and I hate this is like right after lunch and I keep bringing up the example, but anyway, um, you think about it, there has to be something in it for the microbes to engage in behavior. And so, with Vibrio and the food poisoning, what they need is they want to propagate and then be dispersed into the environment. But what is it that, they, that uh, the microbes would want to use quorum sensing for in sinking particles? And so we hypothesized that it was the expression of hydrolytic enzymes. Hydrolytic enzymes are enzymes that, that uh, digest organic matter. They digest that particular organic carbon. And it's the first step in the, the pathway that ultimately leads to respiration. And so it's kind of similar to what we do. You know, we eat uh, some uh, broccoli, right? We eat broccoli, and it's not like it's in our guts and bang, it immediately turns into carbon dioxide, right? There's all these steps along the way. One of our first steps is that we digest it, right? So it's in smaller, smaller molecules that then can pass into our system. That's exactly what these bacteria have to do too. They have to break, these, break this complex mixture of little bits and pieces of organic matter and shell and all kinds of other stuff. They have to break it down into small molecules that then can pass into their mem- across their membranes and into the cell itself. So they digest. And so we hypothesized that this was it. And the reason we're interested in this, you'll see, is, uh, is because when we looked in the literature, you can't see this, and that's okay. So these are all the organisms that used quorum sensing, or at least were known to a few years ago. This list has probably doubled in size since then. Um, and these are not all marine organisms. As a matter of fact, all of them except this one are organisms involved in human disease. And I've highlighted here all the different examples where different organisms use different types of molecules to regulate the expression of hydrolytic enzymes, digestive enzymes. So we had some clue here. And we also had some clues from the marine realm because this is an experiment that was done uh, quite a while ago uh, by Farouk Azam's group and and his uh, cohort. And if you take sinking particle and just put them in a jar, eventually they blow up and turn into little tiny bits. Okay, and then there's no one, they didn't understand why this happened. So hopefully you see a convergence here. So why, why, would, you, why would an organism use quorum sensing to regulate hydrolytic enzymes? Well, it turns out that quite a number of years ago, there was a paper that was published that outlined the theory of why this would be the case. So if you're, this is a sinking particle here. So imagine if you're a microbe here in the center of, of a particle. Making an enzyme is a lot of work. You have to put all kinds of nitrogen in it, which can be scarce. It takes a lot of energy. So it's not something you want to just do for the heck of it. Matter of fact, it's something you need to do if you think it's going to, it's going to yield you those little bits and pieces of, of, of molecules that you need. But what happens is the way this works is when an organism makes those hydrolytic enzymes, they're kind of deployed on their own. So they digest and they make little pieces of molecules. But those, those molecules, when they're digested, are essentially a free-for-all. They, 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 they diffuse. So it's not like there's another enzyme there that grabs them and pulls them in. They just, it's just digestion that happens outside the cell. So you can see the risk of that is if you're a microbe and you digest, you can make go through all the work of making an enzyme, digest a little bit of organic matter, and then all the fruits of your labor just diffuse away. So that would be a problem. That would be a waste of time and a waste of energy. And you know bacteria don't have a lot of time, right? They only live for a day, so they've got to get it right. And so the idea here is that the microbes should all do it at the same time. So if they do it at the same time, one microbe's loss is another one's gain if it's coordinated. And so that's the, that's the reinforcement that leads to an evolutionarily stable relationship that gives rise to the signaling um, process. And the critical thing here to recognize is that making a signaling molecule like an acylate homocerine lactone has to be a lot cheaper, less energy, 
less nutrients, less things like that than the behavior that's being regulated. So we have our sinking particles. This was from a real. This was a. This is from a very bountiful trap. So this is a. This is a test tube. It's about that long. It's about that big around. So you can see here what we're talking about when I told you about the comma in your textbook. You know, if you picture about this being about that wide, that's what we're talking about. All these little bits. Sometimes they smoosh in together to make kind of aggregates. Um, we take this stuff and we came up with an experiment. Took it, we put it in test tubes, and then we added this. Well, first of all, we washed them. So we figured out a way to get all the stuff out of them, all the um, dissolved stuff, all the little bits of organic matter that the microbes would have made, and if there were any signaling molecules, all of that stuff there. So it's kind of like starting from, from scratch. We rinsed them all off, and then we did experiments where we added the signaling molecules, the ones that we bought from the catalog. We added those to the different um, test tubes. And so the idea here is if we saw something different in those test tubes where we added the molecules, then we could say it was quorum sensing. Okay, we added the signaling molecules. This happened. That's the experiment, and we linked it to quorum sensing. And the thing we looked at were the hydrolytic enzyme act, uh, um, activity. We can measure that as well. <clears throat> okay, so when we did this, so this is, the, this is a, a plot of the enzyme activity, and these are different locations, which is what the words are, and that doesn't really matter. But these are the different languages. So these are the three oxo language, and this is the saturated language. And each of these bars is a, a hydrolytic enzyme directed at a different type of biochemical. So we have a phosphatase, which can act on things like nucleotide and maybe even some bonding environments of DNA and RNA, proteins, and lipids. And this is a ratio of the activity of those enzymes, a ratio between the test tubes where we added the, molecule, the signaling molecules versus the ones where we didn't. And those are the control. So the idea here is one means no response. We saw the same activity in the experimental ones as we did in the controls. And if the number is more than one, that means we saw more activity in response to adding those molecules. And in fact, that's what we saw in most cases. Not every case. And so the cases here with these asterisks are where um, we did some, uh, so there are multiple replicates of these things. You can see here, this is telling you how many replicates uh, were done. And the asterisks are the result of a um, statistical test to tell us if the, if the numbers were really different from one. Um, but we see this uh, in quite a number of cases. Interestingly, is we can put this in terms of B. Remember at the very, very beginning of the talk, I was talking about the Martin curve and that B value? Well, just to put that in the context, we can do a mathematical transformation with a bunch of assumptions, admittedly, and come up with a range in the global value of B and the hydrolytic enzyme activity ratio. And so you can see here that the variations we're seeing could describe a lot of the range of observations of B in the environment. So these are the same data, I'm just reorganizing them <clears throat> to show you that we have different types of behaviors. So this is a Clackwatt sound, and this is in the, um, uh, the border between the United States and Canada on the Pacific side. There's some islands there and, and inlets. This is actually a fjord on Vancouver Island. And um, here, in this case, we added the different molecules, the oxo and the saturated, and we saw pretty much the same response, same enzymes, things like that. Here, this is in the Sargasso Sea. So that's in the area, kind of in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And in that case, for whatever reason, the organisms, either they weren't speaking the saturated language, or they weren't using it to regulate enzyme activities like they did for the three oxo. So you can see here's a different example there. And this is a North Pacific subtropical gyre, so the middle of the North Pacific Ocean. And in this case, we didn't see hardly anything except a very strong response in one enzyme activity to one type of molecule. So the point of all this is that 
it's still a very messy story. These are real data. This is not um, uh, any kind of schematic. This is, and I think that if you go forward and research, this is probably what I would call a pretty good outcome, where you have a story that's only mildly confusing. Um, oftentimes, you'll go through all the same amount of work and have something that's even more confusing, which I'm sure you can attest to. Um, your job as a scientist is to figure it out. This is a really neat experiment we did near the Sargasso Sea, where we added uh, different concentrations. This was this blew my mind because basically what it meant is the volume of the language mattered. Okay, so how much signal was there mattered, and you can see that the evidently uh, the uh, microbes there are a little more sensitive to a little you know, whispering some sweet nothings in their ears as opposed to getting all up in their face and yelling at them, okay? Because they were much more responsive when there was less signaling molecules um, than when there was more in this activity, the phosphatase activity. Uh, but you can see that maybe in some of them, a little yelling didn't really, didn't really hurt too much. So the, the volume matters as well. So... So this is kind of the, the end of the line for the story. We've connected this quorum sensing activity to this disaggregation. Okay, and so once, once particles are di uh, disaggregated, so this is um, a plot here of starting out of different types of particles and what they look like after they get digested. And this is an experiment I did a long time ago that shows after that they, they get uh, digested, they get transformed into carbon dioxide. This has been shown by a lot of other people. These are just examples. Okay? So disaggregation is the key. And so now, as we move forward with the story and try to publish it, what we're trying to, to say here is that we think we've seen the ocean in two different regimes, in the biological pump in two different regimes. When you see one where quorum sensing might not be happening, we don't see much of a response in those enzyme assays, and so what that means is that disaggregation is not quorum sensing controlled. Whereas there may be another regime here where disaggregation is quorum sensing controlled. And you can think about it, again, that going back to that food poisoning example, something that happens, bang, soon as the particle moves into its trek. Now in reality, neither one of these end members probably exist. It's always going to be a gradient, some in between of these two uh, examples there. So I um, will leave, that, uh, leave the story where it is, and uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention.